Yes, he had used up his chances. On the island of EA, before a burst of Jap machine gun fire, Ernie Pyle, America's best-loved war correspondent, died as so many American boys he'd written about. Ernie Pyle was killed in action. Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents Words at War, dramatizing the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Our original schedule called for the presentation of another book, but the death of Ernie Pyle in the Pacific made his brave men the timeliest program we could bring you tonight. And so we bring you the stories Ernie Pyle wrote about the American fighting men the songs they sang together and loved so well. Here is a tribute to the little guy who held the love and affection of every American soldier he ever met is Ernie Pyle's last book, entitled with his simple eloquence, Brave Men. What is it like before battle? What do they think about? Well, they're afraid. But not afraid of the physical part of dying. That isn't the way it is. The emotion is rather one of almost desperate reluctance to give up the future. To give up such things as seeing the old lady again, of going on to college, of getting married, of holding on your knee just once the kid you've never seen of becoming the champion salesman of your territory, of driving a coal truck around Kansas City once more. Yes, even of sitting in the sun again on the south side of a house in New Mexico. It's these little hopes and ambitions for some bright tomorrow that makes up the sum total of the worry and anxiety in the hearts of the waiting men. I don't think you can ever fully understand the ties that grow between men who live savagely together, relentlessly communing with death. They're ties of great strength. There's a sense of fidelity to each other in a little core of men who've endured so long and whose hope in the end can be so small. Uh, Lieutenant. Uh... Yes, Sergeant. Well, I'm supposed to go back to rest camp tonight. I know, Buck. But well, we're due to attack tonight. Yeah. Well, Lieutenant, uh, well, I don't think I'd better go. I'll, I'll stay if you need me. Of course I need you, Buck. I always need you. But it's your turn, and I want you to go. Well, I'd just as soon stay, sir. I know, but you're going. That's an order, Buck. Yes, sir. Oh, I can't leave my buddies No, I can't leave my buddies I'm a poor, lonesome cowboy And a long ways from home This was in Italy. Sergeant Buck, a cowboy from Idaho, came back to the little group of old-timers with whom I was standing. You'd have thought he was leaving forever. Well, uh, well, I guess I'll be going. Good luck to you all. Thanks, Buck. Get yourself a good rest. Yeah, I'll only be gone five days. Sure. Oh, you'll be sure. back before you know it. Yeah, well, so long, everybody. Bye, so, long. Long. so long, kid. And, uh, and, well, good luck. Good luck to you, Thanks, Buck. Buck. Thanks, Buck. Take me back to be near them. Take me back to be near them. I'm a poor, lonesome cowboy and a long ways from home. Mm -hmm. It was drizzling and the valleys were swathed in a dismal mist. The artillery of both sides flashed and rumbled around the horizon. The encroaching darkness was heavy and foreboding. 
I walked with Buck to the waiting truck. He kept his eyes on the ground. And I think he might have cried if he'd known how. Hey, uh, Ernie. Yeah, Buck? This'll be the first battle I ever missed with this battalion. Yeah. I sure do wish him luck. Well, they know that. I feel like a deserter. back and lay down on the ground with my other friends waiting for the night orders to march. I lay there in the darkness thinking, terribly touched by the great simple devotion of that soldier who was a cowboy, thinking of the millions of people far away at home who would remain forever unaware of this feeling of the soldier for his comrades. And you know what's the first thing I'm going to do when I get home? What? I'm going to fix it so my kid won't have to fight in the next war. How are you going to do that? Well, I'll tell you. First of all, I'm going to take him up on a garage roof and put 10-pound weights in his hands and make him jump off. That ought to break down the arches. (laughs) (laughs) Then I think I'll feed him a little ground glass every now and then to give him a bad stomach. That ought to make him 4F all right. Yeah, and and I'll make him read by candlelight to ruin his eyes. When I get through with him, he'll be double for it. <laughs> Joe, if I didn't know you so well, I'd say you don't like it over here. Oh, you know me better than that. I just love this nice mud and that German artillery. <laughs> Listen, if I ever get home, they'll have to catch me to bring me back again. Go on, you'd be home a couple of weeks and read about us over here and remember these bull sessions? Why, <laughs> you'd bust out ball and you'd be so homesick. Yeah, well, just give me the chance, that's all. Just give me the chance. Oh, the gun. Guns and the pretty, pretty Huns. What a war! What a war! Oh, the guns, guns and the pretty, pretty Huns. What a lovely, lovely war! But they tell me that a lot of American soldiers who return to America do get homesick for the front. They get an itch for the old, miserable life, a disgusting, illogical yearning to be back again in a place they hated. I'm sure it's true, but I know a lot of soldiers who'd like a chance to put the theory to the test. Behind me is a distinguished and unbroken record for being sick in every country I ever visited. I'd been in Sicily five days when I decided to get sick and get it over with. Well, they established me in a clearing station and finally decided I had battlefield fever. You don't die of that. You just think you will. As I began to feel better, I became aware of the wounded and the dying men who were constantly being brought into the tent. I feel okay. I think I'm going to make it, Doc. Of course you will. You'll be all right. Let me go. I can walk all right. Here your bed's here. Oh, now I want to go there. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me, Doc. You don't call this little scratch anything. Let me out of here. We've got to take care of that wound, son. We're going to send you back to the hospital. I don't want to go to any hospital. I want to get back to my outfit. You wouldn't do your outfit any good right now, son. You go on to the hospital. I've got some good-looking nurses there. I don't care about any nurses. I want to get back to where I belong, now, sir. Now, take it easy, soldier. Take it easy. It was flabbergasting to me to lie there and hear wounded men cuss and beg to be sent right back into the fight. Of course, not all of them did that. It depended on the severity of their wounds and their individual personalities, just as it would in peacetime. But the main impression I got from all the wounded was their wonderful spirit and the thoughtful and attentive attitude of the men who cared for them. Well, eventually, after having indulged myself long enough to keep up my sick record, I got back to the front Frontline conversation covers almost every topic in the world. You know something? For 25 bucks, I'll eat a double-edged razor blade. Now, what you think of that? I wouldn't give you two bits. Now, you can't do it anyway. Yeah, you just put up 25 bucks and I'll show you, and I'll let you examine the inside of my mouth afterwards. How do you do it? I'll just chew them up. <laughs> I haven't got 25 bucks. Yeah. Well, you could all pitch in. Look, I'll take a double-edged razor blade, chew her all up, and swallow her down. Now, what you say? Nah. Can you really do it, Sam? Sure I can, Ernie. 
I used to do it all the time before the war. I, I was offered a job in a carnival. Was that so? <laughs> Hey, Ernie, uh, how about you putting up 25 bucks? No, Sam, I think I'll wait and see it for two bits at the carnival. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's worth 25 bucks to see a guy eat a double-edged blade. <laughs> hey, I wonder if we'll ever get those galoshes they promised us. They've been promising us galoshes for a month. What do you want with galoshes? To keep my feet dry. My feet haven't been dry for six weeks. <laughs> Take a drink of that lousy cognac they sell in Naples. That'll dry your socks before it hits bottom. No kidding, though. I'd sure like some galoshes. Ah, oh, forget the galoshes, will you? That's all you talk about, galosh. Well, what's the matter? You got to talk about something. Anyway, it's not civilized to go around with your feet wet for six weeks. What do you mean, civilized? What's that? <laughs> Back home, we thought we were civilized because we took a lot of baths. I haven't had a bath in two months, and I don't feel any different. Maybe people take too many baths anyway. Maybe they do. I dreamed about baths, but when I got home, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to admit this, I didn't average more than one bath a week all the time I was there. Maybe what we're fighting for is the right to be as dirty as we please. Suits me. It always rains in the infantry, but we never take a bath. I found a hunk of soap one day, but the dirt began to laugh. I took a walk along the historic coast of Normandy after D-Day. It was a lovely day for strolling along the seashore. Men were sleeping on the sand, some of them sleeping forever. Men were floating in the water, but they didn't know they were in the water, for they were dead. You know, on that beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. And they were gone forever now. And yet we could afford it. We could afford it because we had our toehold. Now we lie in the water With the tanks and the mortars We're poor, lonesome soldiers And a long ways from home There were soldiers' packs... Socks and shoe polish. Sewing kits, Bibles, letters from home. Snapshots of wives and sweethearts staring up at you from the sand. Always there are dogs in every invasion. There was a dog on the beach now, still looking pitifully for his masters. He barked appealingly at every soldier who approached, trodden along, eagerly with him for a few feet, and then, sensing himself unwanted, he'd run back to wait in vain for his own people at his own empty boat. Where the sand is our tombstone, where the water is our graveyard, where our bodies are like driftwood, we're a long ways from home. The strong, swirling tides of the Normandy coastline shifted the contours of the sandy beach as they moved in and out. They carried soldiers' bodies out to sea, and later they returned them. They covered the heroes with sand, and then, in their whims, they uncovered them. I walked around what seemed to be a couple of pieces of driftwood sticking out of the sand, but they weren't driftwood. They were a soldier's two feet. The toes of his G.I. shoes pointed toward the land he'd come so far to see which he saw so briefly. Why don't you tell him, Pyle? Why don't you tell him back home what it's really like? All they hear about is a lot of victories and glory stuff. They don't know that every time we advance, somebody gets killed. Why don't you tell him? I told him that was what I tried to do all the time. You see, this soldier was fed up. His outfit had suffered heavy casualties. He was exhausted. He was filled with bitterness. Yet a few days' rest to take it all out of him. He didn't want any credit or glory for himself. He just wanted to be sure the folks at home realized that men were dying. Some folks at home keep thinking of steak While the bullets, they give us a bellyache Hey, Joe, look out! Don't step on it! 
Oh, my gosh, a mine. Where? I don't see it. It's not a mine. Look, it's a little baby rabbit. A rabbit? Hey, don't ever do that again. I thought I was stepping on a mine. Oh, say, he's a cute little fella. Huh? Yeah, 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 he's cute. But look, Bill, don't ever do that again, see? Yeah. Hey, this little fella's hungry. I'm going to take him back and get him some canned milk. You better leave it here. You can't be toting a rabbit around with you. Yeah. Yeah, he's a cute little fella, isn't he? Strange little things happen on the battlefield. Private Bill Westcott found a little rabbit. He fed it tenderly through an eyedropper. It was quite a little rabbit at that. It hopped around everywhere after Westcott, and when the distance got too far, it would go hopping back to the pup tent and snuggle up in Westcott's blanket. All the boys were crazy about it. Then, after about a week, we found the little rabbit dead on the grass. Private Westcott, whose own life was in the balance every day, felt awful bad about that little rabbit. strong point. The young lieutenant kept barking his orders. Spread it out now. Want to draw fire on yourselves? Come on, come on. Don't bunch up like that. Five yards apart. Spread it out. Spread it out. The men didn't talk among themselves. They just went. They weren't heroic figures as they moved forward a few seconds apart. There was a confused excitement and a grim anxiety in their faces. Spread it out. Come on. Spread it out. They seemed terribly pathetic to me. They weren't warriors. They were American boys who by mere chance of fate had wound up with guns in their hands, sneaking up a death-laden street in a strange and shattered city in a faraway country in the driving rain. They were afraid, but it was beyond their power to quit. They had no choice. Hey, Ernie, duck in this doorway. Right. Hey, Ernie, raise your rifle. The correspondents can carry rifles. International law, yeah? Sounds like a silly law if you ask me. Hey, uh, I used to read your column back in Cincinnati, Ernie. You did? Yeah, we're pals, then. Uh, Ernie, uh, could you put my name in? Well, I mean, the family would get a big kick out of it. Sure, let me get the name right. Here, you hold my helmet over the pad? Sure. Thanks, go ahead. Private first class officer. Wait. Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, even with the bullets winding down the street, the soldiers were eager for me to get their names so that the folks back home would know they were in this. I ducked from one doorway to another, getting as many names as I could. Names of the actors in one little drama of the war along the rain-soaked street of a French village. Not much glory in the job they were doing, Whereas as my favorite song and theirs puts it, they've got no time for glory in the infantry. They've got no use for praises loudly sung. Oh, they've got no time for glory in the infantry. Oh, they've got no use for praises loudly sung. But in every soldier's heart in all the infantry Shines the name, shines the name of Roger Young Caught in ambush lay a company of riflemen Just grenades against machine guns in the gloom Caught in ambush till this one of twenty riflemen Volunteered, volunteered to meet his doom Stood the man, Roger Young Fought and died for the men he marched among Like the everlasting courage of the infantry Was the courage of Private Roger Young On the island of New Georgia in the Solomons Stands a simple wooden cross alone to tell 
that beneath the silent coral of the Solomons sleeps a man, sleeps a man remembered well. Mm-hmm. No, they got no time for glory in the infantry. They'll settle for a mention in a guy's newspaper column just so the folks at home will know. Now, a final story. I've told you of the feeling soldiers who face death together have for one another. A feeling those who've stayed at home will never be able to comprehend. Well, this takes me back to Italy and to Captain Henry T. Wasco of Belton, Texas. I have never crossed the trail of any officer so beloved by the men under him. After my father, he came next. He always looked out for us. Always went to bat for us. I never knew him to do anything unfair. I was at the foot of the mule trail the night they brought Captain Wasco down. The moon was nearly full. You could see far up the mountain trail. Dead men had been coming down the trail all evening, lashed on the back of mules. They came lying belly down across the pack saddles. The heads hanging down on one side. And their stiffened legs sticking out awkwardly from the other. I don't know who the first one was. You feel small in the presence of dead men. You don't ask silly questions. This one's Captain Wasco. The unburdened mules moved off to their olive grove. The men in the road seemed reluctant to leave. They stood around. I could sense them moving one by one, close to Captain Wasco's body. Not so much to look, I think, as to say something in finality to him and to themselves. I stood close by and I could hear. Damn it, sir. That's all he said. Damn it, sir, and he walked away. And another man came. I think he was an officer. He looked into the dead captain's face, and then he spoke to him as though he were alive. Sorry, old man. And then the soldier came, and he stood beside the officer and bent over. And he said very tenderly, I sure am sorry, sir. And then the first man squatted down and took the captain's hand. He sat there a full five minutes, looking into the dead captain's face. Finally, he put the hand down. He reached over and gently straightened the points of the captain's collar. And then he sort of rearranged the tattered edges of the uniform around the wound. And then he got up and walked away down the road in the moonlight all alone. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world of woe And there's no sickness or toil or danger In that bright land Such is the powerful fraternity in this ghastly brotherhood. Something that only our fighting men will fully understand. Now, thousands of these men will be returning home before long. They'll be changed. They'll have to learn how to adjust themselves to peace. And all of us will have to learn how to reassemble our broken world into a pattern so firm and so fair that another great war cannot soon be possible. Tell the simple truth, most of us over in France don't pretend to know the right answer. All we can do is fumble and try once more. Try out of the memory of our anguish and be as tolerant of each other as we can. came back
back from Europe, he said that if he saw one more dead man, he feared he would lose his mind. He said this would be his last invasion. He probably meant it. But if he had lived, it wouldn't have been his last invasion. Because although Ernie Pyle freely confessed his fears and his horror of killing, he would go along with the American boys who had no choice but to go where they were ordered. Yes, he wrote his wife that this would be his last invasion. After this, he would write stories from headquarters. But no G.I. believes he would have done that. Ernie Pyle would have gone on as long as there was one American boy who had no choice but to go on. The G.I.s who loved him went out in the face of enemy fire to bring back the body of Ernie Pyle from the spot where he had fallen. And the G.I. fashioned a wooden coffin for Ernie and laid him beside his fellow fighting men. No need to write an epitaph for Ernie Pyle. It has been written by a G.I. on a crude wooden marker that stands over his grave on the desolate isle of E.A. near Okinawa. It reads simply, At this spot, the 77th Infantry Division lost a buddy, Ernie Pyle, April 18, 1945. In the Solomons Stands a simple wooden cross Alone to tell That beneath the silent coral Of the Solomons Sleeps a man Sleeps a man remembered well In tribute to the memory of America's best-loved war correspondent, Ernie Pyle, Words at War has presented a dramatization of his last book, Brave Men. The radio adaptation of Brave Men by Ernie Pyle was by Gerald Holland. Carl Swenson was heard as Ernie Pyle. Others in the cast were Martin Wolfson as narrator, Jim Bowles, Walter Kinsella, Paul Mann, Larry Haynes, Jeffrey Bryant, and Carl Emery. Our ballad singer was Tom Glazer. Organ music was by William Meader, production Garnet Garrison. Words at War is presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime. Next week at this same time, a dramatization of another important war book. This is the National Broadcast.